There are things that I know, but there are things that I do not. Various possible futures are happening simultaneously. I can tell you all of them, but I cannot tell you which one of them will come to pass, because every action causes ripples, consequences both obvious and unforeseen. This is Off Planet Radio. One. Welcome to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. It's been uh, quite some time since we've done one of these. This is the Off Planet Radio podcast. Uh, the website is offplanetradio.com. And um, gosh, this feels so nice to just sit here with a microphone and do a conversation. And uh, we've got a good one for you. Uh, in the room with me, sort of, virtually anyway, is uh, somebody that I love sitting down and talking to because she always brings so many interesting wrinkles to the subjects. Um, and that is Chris Holly, and we want to welcome her to the program well hello everybody hi Randy glad to be here you know I love talking I know especially to you <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we have a lot to talk about because it's been quite some time since we had opinion or opinions on the paranormal so um, this may actually be segment one of para opinion as we go through this but Chris um, it has been a while since we've talked and the world of paranormal, which you track much more efficiently than I do, is an ever-changing kaleidoscope of freaks, curiosities, and uh, unutterable and unspeakable horrors. So maybe what we'll do is just unpack the box and uh, go through a number of subjects. You still, um, first off, before we do anything else, we want to talk about the book a little bit, because uh, the books are now released on Amazon and um, Journeys with the unknown tell us a little bit about the books and uh the, even the journey of just writing and getting this stuff between two covers even if it's virtual well the books came by way of years and years and years of interviews with people that told me extreme stories and i searched through and found that many of the people i really believed believed to be true and honest for many reasons, from body language to, you know, th their actions and reactions in the interview and the subject matter. And I collected and had all this data that I used in articles or just some of it I never used quite before. And I decided it was time to put it all out there before my time on Earth is gone and, and, and let other people take it, read it, and form their own opinions. And the beauty of it is it's stories, or, or not stories, it's encounters, events that really happened to people just like every one of us. So, you know, it's only a matter of time, I think, for everyone to have their own experience that they can't explain. And I always tell them, you're very, it's a good choice, you're better off if you read and get some knowledge behind you on how other people dealed with these things and what they saw and what they encountered so you don't go, you know, crazy if it happens to you. You can be in more control and more focus. So that's when I started to write and write it so that it could go into a book. So I took all these accounts, wrote them in and took all my better articles, put them all together and put them in First, the e-books where you can buy my paperback book in three sections or as one full e-book, and then, of course, as a paperback. And I have the second book all completely done. I'm just too lazy to edit it right now because <laughs> I've got so much going on in my life, which is enormous work. You have yeah. no idea how much a book, how much work is, goes into a book until you sit down and take this task on. But um, it's written. All the material is there. 
because there was just so much data that should be put out there in the world for people to use so they can form opinions, protect themselves, understand if it happens to them, it's not the end of the world, I would hope. Unfortunately for some, I think it was. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's why I did it. And I put the books out, and they're on Amazon, and <clears throat> I have a, a very famous store here on Long Island called The Huntington Review. It's a bookstore, yes, and I've it only takes in mm-hmm. the biggest and the best. And I, they have a thing where they will look at a local author, and if you've passed the test, which was a very difficult test, they would carry you in their bookstore. Well, I was intimidated and didn't want to do it, but my husband did. So it, the paperwork alone to submit it was, you know, a great deal was into this whole thing. Plus, you had to send them a finished book and blah, blah, blah. And they read the book, and the long and the short of it, it's like, I have to say this because I'm so proud of myself. They took my book in, and I made it into this Huntington Review famous bookstore. So I'm thrilled with that. Even if it does nothing for me but get me into that store, the prestige of it alone makes me feel like I should, you know, continue and get my other book ready and, and publish the stuff. But um, well, congratulations on, on congratulations on that. That uh, that is a rather well known store. Yeah, yeah, and then of course, as you, it's you have to apply and do it. With, I'm going to do it to everything else, the other big store. But right now, it's the easiest and the best to, unless you live on Long Island and go into that store, you can just get it on Amazon. And um, I hope you do read it and enjoy it and uh, let me know, you know, what you think. And, of course, if you have your own story that you want to go into book form and last forever, you know where my email is. It's on Facebook, I believe, or on my blog site. You can just... Chris Holly unknown and you'll be there let me know poor Randy will tell you it goes right in the book <laughs> <laughs> yes we know that Chris is very diligent about reporting things she's even reported some of my stuff and uh, right that's awesome because you and I came together I guess what 2011 somewhere in around there because yeah, I think so. I, I have maybe been, you, you Maybe a little even earlier, maybe. I'm not sure. Well, I reached out to I'm you because sure. you were one of the few people who was actually doing real journalism on the Internet in terms of the paranormal and especially UFOs. And as I've often said, I consider Chris Holly to be one of the few true journalists working in this field and for a very long time detailing it, putting it out. And by the way, you can read my review on Amazon when you go to purchase the book, which is... Journey with the Unknown by People Like You and Me, Strange and Unexplained Encounters and Events of People Just Like You. The book is on Amazon. Just um, plug in Chris Holly's name, and lo and behold... Can, can I... Yeah. Let me interrupt right here before I say another thing. Now, I just got finished telling you how prestigious this bookstore is. They wanted two book reviews from people that were well-known and were good book reviews in the, the package that you have to send to them for them to consider your book. And I sent Randy's review of my book because it was wonderful and Brad Steiger's, which everybody knows who Brad Steiger is. And Randy and Brad helped me achieve that. And I want to make sure I thank Randy publicly for writing me such a lovely review. Uh, I, and, uh, you know, I need to, th- <clears throat> but I need to thank you because to have my name breathed in the same sentence with Brad Steiger is just beyond um, <clears throat> anything I can imagine. When I saw the uh, write up for UFO Digest, which is you can also go over to UFO Digest, and uh, there's an article there. Um, I had to stop and think for a minute. Brad Steiger. I was reading Brad Steiger when I was a kid as a scientist. And we, we've done this. We talked with Brad and Sherry several years yeah. ago. Um, that, you know, there are few writers in my life. Um, Robert Heinlein's one. But Brad Steiger is, is one, of the, one of the giants in science fiction. A man who not only 
continues to write that actually goes back into the golden age of science fiction as well. And, you know, I have to ask myself, are we in the golden age of paranormal or, or have we gone to the tabloid section of the bookstore now, Chris? Um, <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder that. I'll tell you one thing, it's very difficult to get people today to take anything paranormal. Instead of us growing, we we stayed in the dark ages, maybe even took maybe 20 steps back from becoming people, a society, a civilization that wants to grow and expand and understand the science of the things we don't understand. Instead, we became a bunch of idiots that want to hang our tongue out the side and be entertained with a keychain of dangling whatevers um, by fake fantasy and foolishness when it comes to all the subjects of the paranormal. So we're in a very slippery slope, I think, right now. I would say when you and I first started doing shows years ago, and it was years ago. Yeah, it was. Randy, um, everyone was taking things a bit more seriously. They really were interested. They really wanted to know. There was a lot of more, like, I think, real research. And then I don't know if it was the, the ridiculousness of the, the TV shows that came out or the overload of the, the TV, sh TV shows that came out or that every fool in the world jumped on board and thought they would become famous if they became, you know, self-appointed in, 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 uh, uh, researchers without any ability to do so. What happened? But I think we lost a lot of ground. So at this point, there's only a very few people that are seriously discussing these subjects or even looking at them with an eye and saying, you think there's, you know, some some ground here or is this just more garbage Be and it's sad because we're losing an enormous amount of data on every single subject that's unknown that's just being flushed away because we don't want to look at this stuff seriously it's like we are too dumb at this point to open our minds and search for answers to things we don't know we want to close down and look at our cell phone and play that game now where they're all walking into the street and looking for a monkey or whatever. Oh, no, the not it Pokemon is. Go. Oh, no, not <laughs> that. Um, yeah, the, game, the, um, the, the, the pastime of morons is what that is. The mind-controlled morons, right. too. Uh, it, and there you go. And they shut down and don't want to know. And again, there's another dimension to this that people don't even think about. But I sure do. Since, and I've been complaining since we started knowing each other, <laughs> put down your cell phones, I hate gadgets, I hate cell phones, I don't own a cell phone, I hate smartphones, stop looking in your hand, put it down, start communicating one-on-one -on -one with other humans before you, you lose the ability to do so. If you contain yourself in a bubble with you and your hand held gadget or sitting in through in front of a computer you're going to lose the ability to deal with other humans one on one and that's going to be the end of our civilization and this is no joke it's a serious thing that's going on and then i realized years ago before we were all walking around staring down we actually used to look around we would actually pay attention to our surroundings when we left the house. We would look at the sky. We would look at other people. We would look at what's that hairy thing standing over there that I'd never saw before. We would actually recognize that they were there in our field of vision. We don't do that anymore. Add in the, 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 the silly little concept like air conditioning in cars. Well, when you and I were young, Randy, we didn't have air conditioning in all our cars. I know that's like craziness today. And we didn't even have power windows or power steering for that matter. We drove around with the windows open in the car, really close to our surroundings, 
so that you could hear, smell, and see everything around you in a closer, more upfront and personal yeah. way. And I remember With driving th- and I remember driving through the cow side and you would go, Oh my God, what is that odor? And it was cow manure. Yep. But it was right, right. part of the environment, wasn't it? And also, you'd be hanging out your window with your arm on the window, looking out if you weren't driving, and you would notice what else was in the cow pasture with the cows. Now, they don't. People drive windows closed, air conditioning blaring, or heat. Um, And the kids all have either a TV screen to look at, and they're looking at a movie, or down in their hands, or playing a game. And the parents are also involved with kind of steering the car, looking at the phone, uh, looking at that, looking at it, but they're not this, focused isn't this on a, the world around them. Isn't this incredible? And with all, yeah, with all that happening, and it's happening to every single one of you that are listening to us, you are giving up your connection with the earth, with the, the, the environment, with the, the humans, with your society with the civilization on the entire planet. You're locking yourself away. So, of course, you don't notice a UFO. You don't care if there's Bigfoot in the corner. You don't, you know, give a damn if that lizard man over there might eat your kid. You're not paying attention. You're completely focused and controlled. And that's a whole other issue we won't go into. But you are being controlled by your gadgets and losing touch with your reality. So with that got swept away a lot of our connection with the paranormal that was important, meaning real good people experiencing incredible things and, you know, it being reported and the rest of us looking at it. That's like getting less and less and less. And it's filling now with stuff that's really crazy, really stupid, really Hollywood, really made up, filled with young people trying to just like walk in and conquer it all. And they don't know their, their, their butt from their bingle. They don't know what they're talking about. And they're out there doing research and ghost hunting. And all they're doing is endangering their lives is what they're doing. And, and we went backwards. And that's really sad. It's another reason why I'm trying to put out everything that I've written and worked so hard on for all these years before it's just lost and swept away. At least the data will be available for people who are interested to look at. So with all that said, what did it get me? And what did it get us? You know, we're still going down, I think, the tube as a society and along with it. All the advancements and um, science things that we should be advancing in we're not we're, we're, we're closing down we don't want to know that oh UFOs you're an idiot well they're flying around I think at this point any person out there could go outside turn off their phone get familiar with the sky understand what a plane or a helicopter looks like what it sounds like what's supposed to be there with the stars and the moon get all that right in your head if you do that it's only a matter of time before you see something that doesn't belong, meaning that is unknown. If you did that, every single one of you would have had a some type of unidentified flying object experience. But it's too much work. You don't want to do that. You want to look at your phone and sit in your bedroom. So <laughs> I doubt one's going to fly in there. <laughs> well, you know, the other side of this is that I, my theory is that most people have had some sort of paranormal, unusual experience in their life, and they've either denied it or blocked it because they couldn't get through their programming, which most people are programmed to believe that certain things are in certain places and that the whole world is perfectly well-ordered. And there's this thing called cognitive dissonance that happens with people where when an event occurs that is outside their parameters, their boundaries, they go into a shutdown mode and they basically deny it. And the mind's marvelous. You can lie to it. will eventually believe the lie. And so I think many people, and I've talked to people who have gone, you know, after you talk to them for a while and get them relaxed, 
They're kind of like, you know, I had this thing one time. And then you find out that what they've really been doing is they just were too afraid to share their experience because they thought they would be laughed at and ridiculed and mocked. So a lot of what we do with these type of programs is to break down those barriers. And, you know, I got to say, the reason why I ask you the question is because I've seen a decline in the paranormal. There's a, there's a certain segment of the Internet that continues to cover it to some degree, but I don't see the vitality in the research, and I don't see the interest in the public. Everybody now wants to talk about, um, well, what would be a, any topic you bring up is also going to be controversial. Flat Earth's a good one. Um, but then again, there's another side to that. You know, it was a good conversation. It's just that some people turned it into a damn religion. And we have all of these anomalous things around us. I mean, we don't really know a lot about our own reality if you start to think about it. You're, you're 100% correct. <clears throat> In fact, I am in a situation that it, what you said, absolutely correct, proves this, your point perfectly. I interviewed this man that for years was harassing me, you know, being really mean to me. You're crazy, you're a liar, you're a fool. Yeah, you know, you see UFOs if flying around your tin hat and uh, calling me um, bad sexual names and stuff, giving me a terrible time. And finally, I, I, he lives near me. I pinned him down and I said, look, it, I want to know what your problem is because you're attacking me for... Completely, I don't annoy you, I don't talk to you, I don't look at you, why are you attacking me? Well, it seems that he saw something once, and, and, and I said, what? And he gave me a, a report of a UFO sighting that had my eyes popping out of my head. He was with his family, so the entire family saw it, sitting at a dock in... West Haven, um, Connecticut, which is right on the Long Island Sound, <clears throat> mm -hmm. when this huge, with a whole bunch of other people eating their hamburgers that they picked up from a hamburger place, and they're sitting there, all these cars full of people, and this huge UFO comes up off out of the water, out of the Long Island Sound, and rises up in front of them all, and they all try to start their cars and leave in panic. And their cars won't start. And they all sit there and watch it. And the thing went out of the water, and it was big, like the size of a ship, you know, a battleship. And it just hovered there for a while. And then slowly went up and then took off. And then their cars started, and they went home. And they had about an hour or so of time missing that wasn't correct, too. And he said, so there you go. There are no UFOs. That was definitely a military uh, craft of ours because there is a large submarine base up in Norfolk, um, not Norfolk, oh, I, I lost the name, New London, Connecticut, and uh, some military bases al al along the coast and Coast Guard bases. And he believed that it was one of their secret you know, marine, underwater, flying UFO crafts that we have, and that's what he saw, and nothing more. So take your UFO being aliened and, you know, stuff it, and was angry at me. So I took and wrote this up, <laughs> and, you know, put the article out there. That man and his family and all the other people, I don't know what it was, but for him to do there were no markings on it. There was no window, no paint. You know, it was completely alien in every sense of the word. Or if it was a top secret military thing, I don't think they would come up in West Haven, which is close to New Haven, which is where Yale University is located, and it's very no. populous, and there's no. people around. That's not where they're going to bring up a military secret mach machine and test it. But it goes to show you exactly what you just said to us, how he formed his mind set 
that that's what it was and nothing more. And I'm an SOB for thinking it's something different when he's the one that just had an amazing UFO encounter. So he could not emotionally or mentally accept that or deal with it or handle it. So he fit it into his knowns, I guess, you know, his accepted place that, that that's the only thing it could be. So that's interesting because people, you're right, probably have that happen all the time. A ghost walks by and they say, look at that big puff of smoke out of nowhere. People should be more careful. You know? <laughs> People should start looking at the clouds in the sky because I'm telling you, the clouds now, very different from what they used to be. And some of those clouds, <laughs> those are not clouds. Um, not, not, not nature's clouds. No. Not nature's clouds, no. Um, these are what you call stacked toroidal cl- clouds. And the people who follow what we do on Off Planet Radio will know we had Sean Gautreau on who talked about the UFOs inside of cloud formation. So I'm not speaking out of class here. But what's interesting to me is the self-protective mechanism that we have built around us to keep from having our, quote, reality bubble burst by uncomfortable truth. An uncomfortable truth right now, and then this may even, this may come into a broader scale, but my theory is that, that as this veil continues to thin, and we've been in this period since, I, I use 2012, it's a great divider, it's not accurate, but okay, 2012 is kind of the apocalypse. So we've kind of been in this unveiling thing now for um, four years, and a lot of things have come out. But at the same time, it seems like people are going deeper and deeper into their shells right now, whether they're electronics, drugs, sex, whatever narcotic or thing that makes you feel good. It seems like people have gone back into their baser things rather than trying to elevate themselves to understand what's really going on on the planet. Yeah, it's the, the, that is the truth. That is exactly what's going on. And, you know, y- 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 what can you do? You can try to do things like you and I are doing right now. Reach out to them and say, kind of shake yourself up a little bit and try to pay attention to what's going on. Because you're part of this scenario. So you can try to sit it out, but that's not the way it's going to end in life. At some point, you're going to have to deal with something that you're totally not prepared for. Why are you allowing that to happen to you? You know, you have to be educated on all things in order to deal with things. I mean, knowledge is the key to life. The more you know the more you can deal with. And we've stopped that. We've kind of stopped that growth. And that that's frightening to me. Absolutely frightening. I mean, you see these things where they go out and talk to the people on the street and they don't know basic things in life. I say to myself, how do you function if you don't know, like, who the president is or who George Washington was or what the economy is and, you know, what's going to happen to you if X, Y, and C happens. And and people are totally controlled and lost. And I, to me, I don't see a big breakup of the control as, as a want with the people. They seem to be very comfortable in being robotic like dummies and not self-willed individuals who live among other individuals and have a good time. That's another thing. I don't think that people are reaching their goals or, or if they're artists, if they are achieving it. I don't even think they try. We've just become like real dummy down. And it, it's sad. It, it really is. I think maybe our ages also are why we look at things differently. And um, I I fear for the generations ahead. I really do. If this is the way it's going to go. So 
so uh, let's move from there um and let's let's, let's go, go ahead you go where you want to go chris i want to talk about the moon because i've been waiting to talk to you about the okay. moon all week yeah yeah See, what i do is I, I i get all these things i say and the first person i always want to talk to is randy because Randy has his own opinion, or he'll know stuff about it that I don't know, and he gives me information so I can straighten my own thinking out. But I have things that I collect and just wait for him. <laughs> and one of them is that I'm only one person. I can't cover, you know, read every single thing out there. And I've been neglecting the moon all my life. I always knew there was something wrong with the moon. The moon was just kind of weird to me. always was. Um, and... Finally, I started watching a bunch of YouTubes that were put out by um, somebody who got the material from NASA and collected all kinds of space video stuff and everything. And it's a little science crowd, which I prefer to read their stuff. It's a little more interesting. And started to read all these things about the moon. And, of course, I did this because I watched a video, a YouTube saying that, you, that they believe the moon was dragged here, and I'm sure you've all heard this before. I have too, and I just never looked into it or ignored it. The, the moon was dragged here billions, maybe, or more, years ago, and positioned between the sun and our planet, exactly so, so that Earth could form the way it has, <clears throat> and develop the climate and the atmosphere and everything needed to produce and provide life on the planet. So I'm starting to read some of this stuff, and they started out by saying how the moon is exactly the right size needed to provide the science stuff we would need for the planet to develop as it has. It's the exact size and the exact distance and the mathematical chance of that happening in nature is very slight, that that would happen that way. All right, that is very interesting. And that it is to the inch the exact size to produce the total eclipses that go on that we all see every so few years. Because if it was just a little, little smaller or a little bigger, it wouldn't work out like that. There would be no total eclipse. Of and I thought, wow, that, that is interesting. And the mathematical um, um, chances of that happening naturally are next to impossible. So I thought, that, that, that really is something. And then I start reading that it's face, it's, what is that called, Randy? Face to face. That, that, there's a name for it. Where we face the moon. And we're synchronized. It yeah, the, the, Always. The, it's face to face. It, right. The orbits are such that at any given time, the Earth is only seeing one side of the moon. That's how you get that right. dark side of the moon thing, which I don't dark understand side. how in the hell it could be dark if it's the one facing the sun, but okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it made for a great okay. album yeah, by Pink Floyd. But, throw out, right. yeah. but it's the side we can't see. We always look at the same side of the moon. And that side is looking at us too, right? With that's it's just positioned exactly the gravity and the and the orbit and everything is exactly right to keep it like that forever, I guess, or until it changes. And that's very interesting that that would happen. And then they talk about we don't know what's on the dark side or the other side. Let's be honest, we don't know. We don't understand, you know, what's back there. Well, that's very interesting, too. And then they started talking about when we sent up the Apollo, I don't know which number it was, or we sent up two man-made orbiting devices in our time right. when we supposedly were up on the moon, but also things that were orbiting. And when we did this, we dropped a heavy portion of the machinery down onto the moon's surface so that we could bring the machinery easier back to in, in, in the Earth without carrying that extra load. And when they dropped it, and it hit the moon, they were recording, and the object 
and the moon rang like a bell and it rang for an hour and they recorded it and they said what what is this if this is you know if this is so this thing has got to be hollow moon's got to be hollow <clears throat> so it was so intriguing to the scientists and NASA that they then went in the second time they sent up something they put a much bigger heavier intentionally payload to be dropped down on to the surface of the moon again and really recorded to see what would happen and I think they dropped it in a different area they covered every basis because that was so strange the first time they drop it and the damn thing rang like a gong and it rang for three hours and they taped it so then that didn't become too public they didn't want that knowledge to be too well known because that meant that there's definitely some kind of hollow thing going on there with the moon. They then decided to take and test, test the dirt. And when they started to test the surface of the moon, they discovered that a lot of the craters were very much the same depth. There wasn't a lot of difference in depth. Where if you actually hit something, it would be probably different depths. And then they figured out that the surface of the moon had a coating of this, the dirt or whatever that dust is up there, of about two miles, I think. And then under that was the core or the empty in, in, insides of it or a city or who knows what. And <clears throat> they found out that the dust was composed of chemical makeups of stuff that net would be best to reject radiation and uh, protect the surface of this orbiting moon um, the best that could possibly be, meaning the best dust you could put up there is what's there. Now, that's odd. So you take and you think about all these things, and then they say there is pictures that they took when they were uh, flying around the moon. And on the dark side, they did catch these huge 15-story high objects sticking up from the moon. And then I start thinking, you know, along with every other thing you read, well, maybe these people aren't all just seeing rocks. Maybe there are pyramids, buildings, all kinds of objects on the moon. And maybe this thing is made, not natural. Maybe it was Maybe it was at Mars and Mars was dying and they dragged it here and got Earth up and going to pro to provide life for what was on Mars. And they all came here. You don't know. And that's the bottom line. We do not know. We are just babes out of the woods, out of the caves, entering technology. And we don't know the science of our own you know, backyard. But I don't think the moon is exactly what we think it is. I think it's much more. So, you know, I, w I wanted to see what you thought. Well, let's toss this out. <clears throat> Some of my readers and listeners probably know I've talked about this before. Um, <clears throat> back in 1975, Ingo Swan, who was one of the original remote viewers for the U.S. Army program, was tasked with um, remote viewing the moon. <clears throat> Swan came back with a report. This goes back to 75 when this book was originally written. Swan came back and reported not only structures on, the, on both sides of the moon and quite large structures of that, but he also reported that there were bases there, that there was alien activity, and I believe he also indicated that there was human activity as well. Obviously, this indication was suppressed. But <clears throat> taking Ingo Swan, who I've come... i, I, I got to tell you, I've read all of his books and I've studied his work. He was considered in his time to be the most accurate psychic working for the military. Um, this was a man who actually was able to go inside of a random number generator machine. This is before we had modern computers and take the random generator machine and flip numbers on it, something that, you know, you can't do unless you crack the box open. So, <clears throat> having said that, no, the moon is not what we think it is. 
Is it artificial? Was it dropped into a slot around our planet? You know, those are... I don't know what to think about it either, Chris. Um, many people have come on, on my interviews and said that they think that the moon is an artificial structure. That it, uh, There are various stories that it may have been towed here as a result of the destruction of Tiamat, which is the planet that occupied um, the lanes in our, in our galaxy where the asteroid belt is now. It's widely believed that Tiamat was a, was a planet like ours that was civilized and it was destroyed in an alien war. And that uh, it's possible that the moon itself survived that destruction and was brought here as some sort of satellite system for us. Um, you know, there's other aspects of it as well. The, the moon, uh, it, it's very weird to look at the moon, the color of it, how it um, resonates. And it does resonate. Um, there's other people that have detected sound coming from the moon using um, <clears throat> amateur radio astronomy. So we've got a bunch of very puzzling aspects of the moon of which we know very little. My one positing is that we've large, largely argued over, I guess, thousands of years that the moon controls the waves on the planet. I tend not to believe that. I don't believe a weaker force of a grav, the weaker gravitational force of something like the moon could move massive bodies of water like that. And I've actually stood on a beach near a standing body of water such as a lake. And there's no evidence that it moves those bodies of water. So, you know, a lot of what we think we know is really open to redefinition at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that the history that we think is real is as fake as anything else you could make up. You know what I mean? I, I don't think it's true. <clears throat> I think there's been, you know, many civilizations here and lost before us that we don't understand. I don't believe for a minute that thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago they were building the kinds of structures that there were on this earth, you know, without uh, machinery, you know, or, or a lot of technology and understanding of math and things like that. You know, I don't think that men crawling out of the caves then built these amazing amazing, you know, uh, block cities that came up all over the earth that were just incredible. And, and the places they built them were incredible. So, you know, all this stuff, I think, is up for review. <laughs> Needs a lot more research. This actually, kind of, this actually kind of goes into our arguments about cultural regression. I mean, forget the pyramids for a minute. We don't even build cathedrals anymore on the scale of, let's say, Lourdes, um, the, um, the, the great cathedrals of Europe, even St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. When's the last time we built anything like that, unless it was the Mormon church? I mean, we're, yeah. talking, we're talking engineering, design, and architecture going back five, six, seven, eight hundred years ago that we now don't practice anymore, much less the architecture that gave us things like like the, the pyramids, uh, the Inca and the Aztec, the Egyptian pyramids, and all the other monolithic structures around the planet that are being, you know, even now uncovered. I mean, there's just an enormous amount of ar archaeological work going on. But we don't understand our own world. I mean, we have this raging argument on the Internet about flat Earth, and it is it is absolutely vile. It's so vile that after doing one show on Flat Earth, I dropped it. I won't participate in it anymore. Because our ignorance is only exceeded right now by our arrogance. And that's probably the most dangerous position for any race to be in. We're arrogant and ignorant at the same time, which is just a horrendous state of affairs. Yeah, yeah. And we, we think we can compete in areas that we can't, too. We're very cocky. Like all this ridiculous stuff you see on 
anything that Hollywood puts out or, the, or anything that the television is involved in where if we had to go up against an alien force, we'd strap our guns on and get in our planes and go out. Are you people all crazy? They wouldn't even come down near the earth to fight with a bunch of little primitive ants running around. They'd squash you from above. You wouldn't know what happened to you. They wanted us gone. We'd be gone. And it wouldn't take, you know, but an afternoon. But people are so, you know, the human race is so arrogant and cocky that they think they can compete on levels that they don't understand. So, you know, you get a grip here. We all have to get our heads completely pulled out of our body parts and get them out there figuring out what was real and what isn't. And that means a lot of research, a lot of hard work, a lot of learning, a lot of reaching, and you got to put down the games, boys, and become men <laughs> and get to the getting. And that's not happening in our society. Randy, can we take a break? I need yeah. a, just a yeah. two-minute break. Sure. All right? Take All right. five. Okay. Thank you. This is Off Planet Radio. This is your last chance. This is Off Planet Radio. was uh, actually a good time to do that. Um, you know, on the, all of these mysterious subjects, one of the signs of intelligent life is you have to be fluid in your thinking. I'll just remind you that we lived with the Newtonian universe for hundreds of years. In the 20th century, Albert Einstein came in with the theory of gravitation equals mc squared and this new model of physics. And yet, 
Within that same century, in fact, within 50 years, quantum physics erupted and disrupted the Einsteinian model. Why? Because people probe and ask questions and are fluid and their, their minds open to things that sometimes are very hard to conceive. Chris, um, do you have another subject? I know it. I feel it. I sense it. <laughs> I have a few, but the the next one that when I saw it, I thought, i got to ask Randy about this because I, I don't know anything about this. Is, you know, late at night when I can't sleep and I start searching around on the YouTube, I can find all kinds of subjects that then blossom into things I'm writing about for three weeks. I don't know if I'm going to write about this, but I had to ask you. I saw this group of YouTubes and then, you know, one thing leads to another, went and read different articles and wherever they connected me to. And it was about this military group. And the interview was with soldiers. And um, the soldiers were talking about a mission they had in the Middle East. Now, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm, sometimes I'm just brain dead on remembering names and things. I don't remember what part of the Middle East it was in. But it was in the desert. And there was this town you know, way out in the middle of nowhere, pretty much, that was being tormented by what they said, a giant that lived in the hills and the mountain that was eating the poor people of the village. And um, it was it was becoming out, out of hand. He was, you know, gobbling up the, the, the locals. So they sent in a troop of our military to go up in the mountains and see what was up in there to help defend these people against what was going on. And they found a 15 foot tall, red haired, wild man giant who was light skinned and absolutely, they couldn't bring him down. They shot him. They threw things at him. They tried to blow him up. And he killed most of the troop and unfortunately, I think, devoured them. Well, when that got back, the military then sent up a whole platoon or two, I'm not sure, and helicopters and the whole thing. And they sent up this huge group of military men, highly trained, and they went up there and had a royal battle with this thing. And it took all they had to kill it including rocketing out of the helicopter at it, and finally killed it. And then they took and put it on a big transport plane and flew it back to a military base in the Middle East where the soldiers all got a look at it, the ones that had to fly it back to the States. And they drew pictures of it and they gave descriptions of it. And they said he was on a big platform they had placed him in the fetal position but he was at least 15 feet tall and it weighed put to put it on the plane they knew he weighed 1100 pounds and that he was red-haired and smelled to high heaven it smelled so bad they never smelled anything like it as the guy said like something that hadn't been washed in a thousand years so which might have been the case so they took this dead thing and they packed it nice and they flew it back to a military base in the United States. And that was the end of the story. And then other soldiers came back and said, oh, yeah, they've all had little problems with these around the world, these giant creatures that they would have to do battle with and were so hard to kill. And I thought to myself, this is the most bizarre thing I ever heard. I've had people, you know, say there's giants and there's giant skeletons and giants are part of the scheme of things and we refuse to, you know, accept, look at, or research this too. But it's very hard when all these military guys are telling you, oh, yeah, we had to kill one of those. I mean, it startled me. <clears throat> and I didn't find the videos or the people that were giving this information to be people that were trying to break through on the internet with a big new 
story so that their psychic, let's say, it's it. I didn't find this. It was just random information that the military guys were interviewed about when they took part in this giant problem. I don't know what to make of it. What do you make of this, Randy? Well, the giants have been recorded in history. They were recorded in the Bible. Um, you have the story of David Goliath written, recorded in the Bible. And there are a lot of people that have done great research on this. Steve Quayle is one of them. I don't like a lot of Steve Quayle's other work, but I have to say that he did a lot of great work in uncovering um, the uh, historical data and the scientific and archaeological data relating to um, the giants. I mean, bones have been discovered all over the planet, including here in the North American continent. So, it's not out of the realm of real at all to expect that we would still have vestiges of giants roaming the planet. Now, I have been told by a very close associate that some of these giants have actually been encased in, in what are called mounds and kept there, and that this particular person, and this story is out, actually out on the internet, anyone can go hear the story, it's on Project Camelot, and it's with my friend Shane, talking about communicating with them telepathically. Um, as ridiculous as that sounds, it's not really at all. Um, we have you know, enough historical backdrop that we have to believe that these creatures have been here for a long time, these beings. Um, I'm not certain that what we have presently being reported is much more than probably what I call feral giants, the giants that were largely abandoned. There's a strong sense that, you know, in all likelihood, these probably were at one time intelligent creatures, but, you know, the ancient legend says that they were products of, uh, well, the interaction between um, fallen angels and uh, women who were sons and daughters of men and so, you know, these go back to the ancient Nephilim legends. Well, it sure is interesting. I will say that. And I do know that there, you know, are giant people on the earth, but I think they don't go too much past, like, nine foot. Something 15 feet high. I'm five foot three. So, to me, this is, like, very scary stuff. To say the least, I mean, I do think that there's some, I do understand that something like that would have to eat, and it makes sense if he's in the middle of the East, there's not a, you know enough goats around to feed something that big, that he would, you know, hunt humans. It would, it would be, a, you know, food for him. But uh, the whole thing is really frightening. Well, the account in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament says that the giants had begun to eat everything, the vegetation, the animals, even the people. That in, that's yeah. an ancient you know, accounting of a story that, um, whether you consider it history or not, you have to consider it mythologically as an, an account of something that happened. Um, these legends go back not just to the Bible, but even the ancient Sumerian legends as well. So, you know, the, the story of Gilgamesh and on and on we have the legends. We have even the fairy tales that we grew up with, Jack and the Beanstalk. You know, what's up with that? I mean, they wrote those things based on, on stories that were handed down through oral, oral accounts. So we have to believe that somewhere hidden in our human latent memory are, are the accounts of these beings that, that lived among us. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about creatures that live among us, I also <clears throat> had a conversation with someone that linked me back to a story I wrote when I was writing about Plum Island. And it happened in the 2000s. I can't remember if it was 2003 or four, but around in that period, Plum Island, which everybody, I think, understands, is a notorious lab off of the end of Long Island that is extremely dangerous, where they do all kinds of experiments on animals and disease, and I've been noted to have 
been the home of all the Nazi scientists that were brought here after World War II and put out there to continue their experiments. And UFOs were brought, they think, with them. Aliens have been connected to it. It's a very bad, dark place. And it still exists. They lied. The government lied to the United States and said because it's so close to such a huge population, New York City, that they're going to close it because it's so dangerous and move it to the middle of Kansas. And then they claimed that they did that, and they didn't. Absolutely nothing changed, and they continued on as normal and are still out there, still doing their terrible deeds. So with that said, my story was about um, one day the Plum Island security screwed up. And on the beach of Plum Island was a dead body. And they called the locals, which was Montauk Point Police. And they, that police department went over to deal with the dead body. And what they found was a, a thin, tall, like uh, over six foot tall, but not like huge, you know, maybe like in the six, lower six foot area, man with um, five strange holes bored into his skull and he was laying dead in summer-like clothes or odd clothing because it was the middle of winter and he had extremely long arms and 18-inch fingers. And everybody went, what? Yeah, extremely long arms and 18-inch fingers. The local police didn't know what to do. They packed it up, brought it to their police morgue on the end of Long Island in Montauk Point, where the military swooped down on them, came in, and then this is where the story picks up again. A nurse that is known through, you know, the grapevine of my family worked in part of the area where this was being um, done. And she claims that the body was then brought to a large hospital center on Long Island and packed in ice correctly and then flown to a military base down near the Washington, D.C. area. Now, my question is, what the hell was that thing? (laughs) Basically, it's too close to home for me to be comfortable. I live on Long Island. You know, that's not that far from me. And this 18-inch long-armed creature, I kept thinking, well, was it an alien? Was he an experiment? Was he a dimensional creature we don't understand? And then I asked Randy, because I admit to the ignorance, I know nothing about this creature they call the Slender Man, other than I thought it was a comic strip um, f- uh, figure, fantasy fiction. But I think he had long fingers. And it's been bothering me all these years. What, it must, is it an alien? What did they find? What would have long, long arms and 18-inch fingers that they had to wisp away in the middle of the night and pack an ice and the government take? And that story can be found in old newspapers and things because it hit the local papers in Montauk Point when it took place that they found him. So it's not a big secret, but it was swept quickly under the rug and everybody forgot about it and and nobody seemed too interested. I'm interested. I want to know what that was. What do you think? Well, first let me point out that you live on Long Island. (laughs) You've You've got Plum Island, you've got Montauk, you've got Spook Central on Long Island. And so, you know, we could, we could play around with, with a whole bunch of images here. Um, apparently, Slenderman himself is a, is a fictional character on the internet. Uh, I just looked it up on Wikipedia because I was curious. Yeah, that's what I thought. Eric Knudsen, a.k.a. Victor Surge, in 2009 began um, this internet meme on Slenderman. So, it's kind of a recent um, sort of legendary thing that's happened. But I suspect, and you and I talked about this before we went on tonight, a lot of the imagery we have in comic books and fictional characters going way back are based on real things. So 
you know, there's that compo component, and then there's the component of human consciousness that is allowing now for the strange to come into our um, our field of consciousness. Well, kind of the opposite of what we were talking about before we took the break was there are people out there who are allowing things to come through the, the veil that's been thinning for a long time. And it's interesting that Slender Man shows up on the internet as his character, but we've got to remember that um, we also have the shadow people. Now, <laughs> you and I have talked about this before. Um, we've had guests on the show that have talked about it. The shadow people and um, uh, some of these other occurrences. The black-eyed children is another one that's creepy that's gotten a lot of documentation as well from some very good writers um i've seen the shadow beings uh, i've seen these beings in different places so i know they exist so to discredit slender man on the basis that it is some urban legend against the backdrop of this strange creature that was found on plum island it kind of begs the question what's really going on is it possible for something like this to exist and if it if it's possible and it shows up on plum island and the military comes i'd have to say that um somebody was trying to cover up um let's just say something that maybe escaped from a laboratory would be my first grasp at, at entertaining the subject yeah and that that's terrifying to me because plum island is known to do things like that and I think it should be stopped personally but um, obviously they had some kind of thing that they maybe made that uh, died and you know got away from them it, it, if I don't know what could be more frightening than that and then you have to say to yourself if Slender Man is a modern thing and that came on board in the early 2000s and then this thing was found on Plum Island. <clears throat> Could it be coincidental, or do they now have these 18-inch long, thin creatures roaming around, and they quickly developed the thin man concept to cover it up and, you know, hide it and sweep it all together as fantasy? You know, I, 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 I don't know anymore. I don't know anymore. But it's also so coincidental that every time something becomes part of our reality or we're starting to see or recognize or or it's there or it also becomes a hollywood or television type entertainment and i think there's a connection there this is a question of which comes first the imagination or the real thing right you know oh, we've, we've, li is, we've lived long enough now to see science fiction come true I mean, you know, anybody that grew up in the in the post World War period, the nineteen forties, certainly in the nineteen fifties, realizes that those old sci fi films don't even hold up against um pictures of modern aircraft anymore. Plus the fact yeah. that you add in things like computers and stealth bombers and all the common technology that we know about, not even to mention the fact that the black tech's probably 50 to 100 years advanced, so the military is obviously sitting on tremendously advanced technology in every field, one of which would certainly be biology. But the fiction writers were the people that gave us the holes in the matrix to imagine things in a certain way. And, you know, we can't rule out that we're creative, we're creative people. We literally do create from our minds. We have that ability. And I don't rule out at any given time that, that, that just because something is in a work of fiction, it may not also have a corollary that's true. Because I, yeah. I've lived long enough, I've seen enough strange things that I, I, I know for a fact that some of the things that are out there are much stranger than some of the things that have been written about. But, you know, go read... Um, uh, some real high-end sci-fi people like H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, even some of Stephen King's stuff's pretty hideous. 
Uh, even William Burroughs, the inventor of Tarzan, was writing uh, some pretty high-octane sci-fi back in the 20s and 30s. So, you know, n n none of this excludes the reality of the fact that what we're talking about is within the realm of, of the true, and yet at the same time has this kind of comic book-like aura to it. Yep. Which I kind of yeah. like. I love comic books. So, you know, it, it's like the the Batman character. <clears throat> it's a very dark character that's only been allowed to develop that way over the last 20 years. Growing up, as I did reading comic books in the 60s, there was what was called the Comics Code, and they weren't allowed to present a lot of the stuff that they do now in um, <clears throat> comic books. But the Batman character is actually a, an amalgam of any number of of imaginative characters um, going back into ancient mythology. And I find it interesting that probably in the last 20 years, the Batman has kind of become this cultural icon of this dark Avenger hero slash villain type thing that um, a lot of people have kind of absorbed into their psyche. So we're, if we absorb it into our psyche, do we then project it back out into some form that becomes, quote, real? I don't know. I don't know. I have no, no answers for any <laughs> of those questions other than it's just more stuff that we don't yet understand. And that's the truth of it. We just need to keep going, keep learning, keep digging, keep, you know, after things until we do understand it. Not get lost in the mind control thing that's going on, where we're kept stupid and controlled. Everybody's kept in a little bubble. And yeah. as long as they stay in their little bubble and are controlled and out of the way of what really is going on, everybody is happy. Most of all, those who are controlling us. And, you know, isn't anyone even concerned about who it is that is controlling us and why? Or is that so frightening that they don't dare go near it? And that's my opinion of it. They'd much rather just play games and hide. And if that's the way you want to spend the beautiful life that's been given to you, you know, go ahead. But you also are going to be the most boring population of people that ever walked the earth. For God's sakes, you're not even trying to invent fire. <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's the truth. Any, uh, an ape can push buttons, people. It doesn't mean that you're techie or, or, or educated or smart. Oh, an ape can do, actually, things. primates can do very interesting things. Um, right. But they can't create. They simply well, we're are going that way too. Well, that is the problem. That's what's being bled out of us. Yeah. It goes back to even talking about the creation of your books and the genesis of the idea for that of sitting down and creating something. Um, we become a generation of consumers. We become passive. We walk around now with devices in front of our faces. By the way. I understand that a couple of guys fell off of the side of a, 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 a hill playing Pokemon Go. Um, they weren't killed, oh, but God. I think they hauled them off in an ambulance. You know, what a, what a pack of idiots. First off, they're hypnotized by their devices. I don't know that people realize the pixel density of what is called the AMOLED screen on a smartphone is so high that the... You know about the flicker rate on television. Well, the flicker rate right. on yeah, enameled uh, these these um, screens that are in these phones is so high it operates at a subconscious level. So basically, there's a state of hypnosis attached to these devices. These devices are putting out frequencies. These devices are computing at speeds well beyond the ability of humans even comprehend we're now talking about comprehension of data on a, on a level of nanoseconds what do you think that is doing to rewire the human consciousness when everything is going on around you is being represented and i did say it that way represented on a flat screen 
Are you not being rendered into a flat space? Not only that, are you also having your brain retrained to only accept that kind of data and to absolute take the data that you are given as truth? I mean, people don't research or actually know how things work. They think they do, but they don't. Uh, I don't know many people that could go outside and build something from nothing at all. And the people I do know, the other like writers are people that create something out of nothing. Artists, uh, architects, things like this. People that are creating, building, and those developing the technology that keeps you so <clears throat> controlled by those who then take the the technology and use it to control you. Um, <clears throat> all those people that are actually creating things from nothing spend very little time, whether you know it or not, looking at their cell phone, playing games, or just staring at TV. These people don't. They read, they, they do physical research, they sit there and actually attempt to make art or write or build a machine or do something creative like your wife to build a garden yeah too many people have lost that ability they can't do it and they say to me which I think is a, a very interesting I, um, I, I had many young people send me an article and say what do you think uh, can I you know I'm going to open my site and this is what I'm going to put up and it was it was completely, you know, spelled incorrectly. There was no punctuation at all. Uh, I couldn't understand what they were saying. Oh, the state of grammar was, is dead. I mean, I read right, articles right, right. now from major websites, and there's just horrible, horrible errors in grammar, spelling, they're, they're, syntax. They're, it's atrocious. Run, run on, I have to watch it myself. It's a bit, but there's run-on sentences that are like three days long. Things like that. And, and they say, I'm sorry, but you're not ready. you got to go and learn how to do this. You know, go on Word. Let it correct all your spelling. Buy, the thing, buy something that corrects your grammar and your punctuation. But you can't put out stuff like that. You have to at least have it a little bit clean. Yeah, can I suggest something? Buy something that corrects your spelling. Buy a dictionary. A hardbound, <laughs> big, thick ass. If you drop this thing on your toe, you're going to break something. Buy one of those and actually use a physical book. I can't, I can't stress this. I'm a pretty good writer. I don't write a lot these days, but I love to write. I can't stress enough the value of using a good dictionary to look words up physically, not on your, not on your computer screen. And the reason for that is... There's a learning process that goes into this. When you start looking things up, hard copy, you're pointing your fingers on a page, you're looking at a word, you're seeing it in front of your eyes, you're going to integrate that knowledge. That is how really good readers are able to look at a page. I can sight read a page of text. I can literally look at the page and begin to read it. And I probably won't stumble on words. I may occasionally stumble on structure. The secret to writing or creating anything is to engage it at the most basic level. You can't do that in the digital world. People right. who are, and you also have to learn the meaning of the words you're using. The meaning and the usage. You know, right, context. Right. Context. I've heard people and, and, use words, and if you diagram the sentence, it made sense, but the context of the word didn't make sense, you know? Here's where language comes in. It's, and, and then I get back, well, that's too hard. I said, well, you're not going to learn anything that's not hard, and there's nothing wrong with things being hard or too much work. Put the work into it. Let it be a little hard. Grow yourself. Grow your brain. Oh, no, no, no. They just want to do it the way with they've got, and that's it. Well, you can't. You have to learn how to do things. And, and that seems to be... When I was young, I was never a big TV person. And before computers, 
and even with computers, I used to read a book a day. I did that for years, and it got very expensive. So then I'd have to resell them or stop for periods and go to the library or something like that. I had so many books. I must have given away tens of thousands of books in my life. I'm serious. I would have such big, um, you know, libraries of books. I stopped that and then went to about three books a week. But I never, ever, I'm down to now, I have problems with my eyes. Maybe a book or two, maybe three a month. But I have to buy the large print and it's difficult. Yeah. You can never stop feeding your brain. It's the one thing you cannot overfeed. You won't get fat, you won't get too smart, and you won't get, you know, hurt. What you'll do is feed yourself with the knowledge, the key to all life, so that anything that you come up against, you might have a piece of knowledge that'll get you out of it, or save you, or help you, or you get the job instead, or you get the promotion instead, or you can fulfill a dream because you had the knowledge to give you the courage to try. And all this is lost. And we have generations of, they're almost like robots instead of people. And what you were telling them about the flat screen life is the truth. He, he, he's not trying to, he's telling you the truth. Listen, you got to turn the stuff off, feed your brain, and go out into this earth, on this earth, on this planet, into your society without being hooked up to something controlling you. And you don't know what's feeding stuff into your brain. All you know is that you're hooked up into a wireless world where anybody could be feeding anything and brainwashing and, and subconsciously controlling you and you would have no idea of it. So don't think you're, you know, a wise uh, beyond, you know, all mankind and this is not happening to you. Oh, it's happening to you. And if you don't think so, turn everything off. See how in three weeks, how different you are. But Randy, you can't get people to do it. Can't. They won't do it. Yeah, and humanity is probably looking at a horrible consequence from all of that. I can't help but think it. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> that, uh, <laughs> you know, if there's going to be and I, it's a horrible thing to say, but if there's going to be a culling of humanity, it will be because, be because we capitulated to this technology and we gave up our natural senses, our natural abilities, and our natural curiosity. Um, and our natural genius. Yeah. Everybody yeah. has something they're really good at. Exactly. But it's being lost. Yeah. It's being lost. And you got to get it and you got to, and something you love to do. That's what you should be doing, what you love to do and what you're good at. And if you're not, you're just a waste of flesh to me because you have the ability to do it. Don't just sit there because now you're telling me, well, I'm really too lazy. I'm really too lazy to live my life fully. Oh, come on, people. I want you're something wasting, easy. You're I want, daylight. <laughs> I, want to, I want to write and I want to do it now, damn it. Yeah. Then do it. Yep. But do you know it. what? Do you it. need skills. Um, you can write all you want, but if you're going to write garbage and gibberish, I don't know how much of an audience there is. Chris, I got well, this. You, you get, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, I'm saying just agreeing with you. Next on the subject, um, the article that you've just put out, Sex, Aliens, and Humans. Let's have a talk. Okay, so, <laughs> so somebody's going to flash back to the last show we did, which was Alien Sex Fiends, which was the story of the two um, <clears throat> rather lovely young ladies who apparently were having wild sex on UFOs with uh, reptilians, which I don't even know how that works, and I certainly have no interest in knowing the arousal level for anything that's not at least somewhat um, homo sapiens. So. But that was the last show <laughs> that you and I did together. And, you know, this thing just does not go away. 
we're all adults here. I mean, we can talk about this, but I mean, really, you know, this this made me. Chris doesn't have too many anger problems, but this caused a little bit of an anger flare up in me. This garbage with this alien sex stuff. Give me a break. Grow up. Read a goddamn book. Please stop. I can't stand it. I, again, can't sleep at night on the YouTube. Come across this crap where there, there's an interview with an old lady and she should clean her mouth out with soap. She's way too old to be discussing this stuff with this young man. <laughs> it was, you know, because she was really wanting to get into it. This dysfunctional, sexually dysfunctional old lady who definitely didn't get enough in her life <laughs> is now telling this <laughs> self-appointed research UFO uh, alien researcher, with no experience, this host of whatever the hell it was he was, taping and doing, making this stuff. He's questioning this old woman who claims that she gets messages played back and I, I don't know the exact of it. It was just moronic. It's the TV or the radio where they call her up and, I don't know, and she plays it backwards and she has these big conversations with aliens and they also come and talk to her in her head and I'm sure many people talk to this old lady in her head. And she was convinced that the, there are aliens that come and they um, use our bodies, human bodies, to then go out and, I love it, smoke cigarettes, smoke dope, drink alcohol, get drunk, gamble in Vegas, and have lots of sex with humans. They love doing this stuff. They love it all. All that bad stuff, they love it. They eat too much, they drink too much, they party hardy, but they do it in a human body, and they take out the souls. They were also doing something with souls that I couldn't figure out, but everybody had a soul, but uh, all right. So her premise is that these aliens come, and they suck out the soul of some person they pick out, and they put their soul in that human body, and then they, I swear... Go to a place like Vegas and party hardy. And they drink and they smoke and they take dope and they eat and they have lobster and they have huge amounts of unprotected sex with all these willing human partners. Okay. Mm. All right, even if you do buy it. The kid never asked this old lady not one question like, well, what do you do with the souls? Where do the souls go? I mean, I, I was very sarcastic in my article I hope you all do go read it it's on my, my blog site you know what do they do sit in the soul sit and binge watch their TV you know sp- special series while the aliens got their body in Vegas or do they you know just lay down and take a nap on, on you know w- w- what's going on here and then where's the, the alien stole while uh, aliens body while the alien soul is in the human body. I mean, it really gets complex. Where are they putting all these bodies and these souls? And re- She never answers any of those questions. He doesn't ask them. And then he, they go about how she's, they are impregnating all these humans, and that's the way they're doing it. But, you know, doing this body snatching, going and partying business, they impregnate all these, humans or take and gather up if it's a female alien uh, the sperm of males and use it and they make all these hybrid children and then all these humans give birth to these half alien babies and I said to myself wait 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 wait, wait. is anybody going to ask a question here at all of what's going on in the meantime I drop down and look at the comments I'm saying, please, God, people are not buying this, are they? Well, many of them had the same view of it as I did. This is the most ridiculous garbage ever put out there. Unfortunately, there were comment after comment after comment of people who were believing this sink line, line sink, what is that expression? Sink line and, they were believing it. Hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. I knew I left something out. (laughs) 
<laughs> you didn't have a and, full tackle kit there, sweetheart. Right, I didn't have a whole fishing <laughs> kit going. And, and they were believing this nonsense. And so then I, you know, go in my article and continue and say, well, wait a minute. If the soul of the alien is in the human body and taking this human body and using it to impregnate all these other humans with the human guy's body, they're using the human guy's penis and sperm, which means he's making another human baby. He's not making an alien baby. <laughs> so where are all these alien babies coming from, you idiots? So anyway, <laughs> well. I just got angry. It, it was so bad. And then I went on to say, please, if you're going to discuss this stuff. And then I went, also, I, I watched a bunch of other videos, and they had two women. They were terribly out of shape. I'm sorry. They were extremely <laughs> obese. <laughs> and very, very sickly looking. And they were supposed to be constantly taken, impregnated, carrying fetuses, and then having them removed. And the babies finished off in a lab, in an alien lab. Let's lo be logical here. If you're an alien, do you go to pick out that? No, you go pick out a 15 year old girl with healthy eggs. And you either keep the girl and never return her. So she's kept in a controlled environment if you're going to use her in that fashion. Or you simply remove, remove the material needed and use it to do a controlled experiment in an alien lab. You do not send two big fat women back who might then take all kinds of medication, lay around all day, smoke cigarettes, drink booze, and do very dangerous things to something as sophisticated as an alien experiment, and as important as a hybrid child. No, it don't work that way. So all this stuff is nonsense that's being fed to people because they don't understand logical things or how science actually works and how experiments are actually done. They're done in controlled environments. And just don't ever forget those two words, extreme controlled environments. So all your hard work isn't flushed away so this is what this, the, all of this got me so angry and then the bottom line was people first of all races means within a, space, a species there are, in our species we have orientals and blacks and whites and greens and yellows all kinds of different people all humans in the same species but different races Species means a different being altogether, like a fish and a dog. And I said you can't take a cat and a dog and make a kitten that barks or a big foot and a fish and make a hairy fish foot. It, it, it can't be done unless you take and splice out part of the species from one and in a laboratory splice it together. It's extremely painful and takes a lot of know-how and extreme advancement to splice together species to make a new hybrid species. Yes, I think that is going on. I think people like a Randy are taken and his biological material used to help produce a new hybrid species to maybe populate the universe on different planets or make it more viable more easier for an alien um, species to enter our atmosphere and live here. They try to hybrid us or hybrid a new species to live here. And I think we are taken and abducted. And when we're younger and healthy, that's when a lot of the material is taken. And then we're returned. And a lot of people that are exactly what they want are reused. They're like farms and they, take them back again, they'll take a little bit more of whatever that biological material is from them and return them and so forth and so on. The ones that they want to keep, to keep, they don't return you. And that's where I think millions of missing people go. However, they don't do it like these broads are telling you. 
you don't have a green lover that visits you at night. Now you have a wild bang up time and then get pregnant. And have, all of that is impossible. So stop thinking like an idiot. I'm sorry. But, you know, it has to be said. And in the meantime, the poor people that are being taken and their material is being used and they are having their sperm and eggs and, and, and genetic material and DNA, uh, you know, taken and, and, and um, formed off of them and possibly regrown somewhere else and used for cloning, splicing, making hybrids, all that stuff. They stay silent and quiet because they don't want any part of this chaos, confusion, circus show, freak show that's going on on the internet and on the, the cashier tabloids at the supermarket. So I just couldn't sit still anymore. I had to scream and yell about it. And that's my article. Well, you know, from my standpoint, let's put this under a different light. As you were talking about this, a thought came into my head, so I did some quick looking. I don't know if you've ever heard of the terms incubus and succubus before, but uh, I looked this up, and it says, according to the Malleus Maleficarium, or Witch's Hammer, written by Henrik Kramer in 1486... A succubus collects semen from the men she seduces. The incubi, or male demons, then use the semen to impregnate human females, thus explaining how demons could apparently sire children, despite the traditional belief that they were incapable of reproduction. Children, so begotten, are called cambions and were supposed to be those who were born deformed or were more susceptible to supernatural influences. It sounds to me like the interview that you heard was kind of a rewrite of this very ancient um, demonology that's been going around for thousands and thousands of years. Just a rewrite. They just drop alien in instead of demon, and boom, there you go. You got yourself a nice nice conversation. And the women, they claim, well, you know, that they have alien lovers, and, you know, they're giving birth to children, and the children disappear. Or I was, there was one woman that, brought up a point that she was pregnant by her husband. She was a human person impregnated by another human. She was just a pregnant girl. And she was taken, and when she was returned, her baby was gone. And to me, that was heartbreaking and a horrible thing to think about. And I didn't really want to write too much about it. But I think that also takes place, where they take a human fetus, God help them, and do what they want with it. But... um. I don't believe, like, these blonde-haired bimbos that are all having this hot sex with all these alien guys. How, first of all, I doubt many aliens have a nice penis. They probably don't know what a penis is, much less have one. So, you know, all, all of this, all I ask, engage your thinking. Engage your mind before you blindly believe the craziness of the Internet. You just said penis on my show. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> you may be the only person that's ever said penis on my show. That's that's I'm amazing. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I thought it was funny. I, I, I muted the mic out because I was going to blow water all over my desk here, um, enjoying it. You know, and you got to laugh because um, people really are morons now. And they, they don't know how to read. I mean, I, I've studied demonology. So the incubus succubus thing for me was I just pulled a quick article up on uh, on the Wikipedia because it's so authoritative. Mm-hmm. But um, I just wanted it's very to... much. You're absolutely right, and I should have known that because I know all of that. <laughs> and it was it was you know like script writers they just write the same script. Yeah, you just drop you TV, just drop a new character. Different people, right? You know, it said but, that uh, it said in Hollywood they only really make five different movie plots. No, but any thinking human should know that. But I read comments of adults that believe this stuff that they were saying. Oh, yes, I know. I know somebody. No, you don't. You don't know basic biology. You fell asleep in 10th grade and you didn't pay attention. Well, you and I have both. 
<laughs> the difference is that you and I have both interviewed enough people. And we've had enough experiences that we can kind of sense the real. I don't doubt that there is an alien hybrid breeding program at all. Um, uh, no, me neither. You know, and that was 100%. why I... That was why I wanted to interview David Jacobs. Now, Dave Jacobs, there's there are some issues, but in terms of what he reported from his own research and his own data, he was corroborating what I had already seen and heard and talking to numerous people going back to what, the beginning of when I started this show. There's compelling evidence of this, and it's very systematically been documented over years. Going back even to the 60s, I mean, the, we had these stories of people who, you know, Betty and Barney Hill, and I think Barney Hill never wanted to report that he felt he had been, quote, harvested in that abduction encounter. So, you know, there's a lot of evidence, anecdotal and otherwise, that we can point to. Why do you want to go listen to a really bad radio or TV, YouTube show, whatever it was, rehash what is basically a very poor representation of the um, the incubus and succubus story? Because it's not the same thing. No. Or listen to a couple of bimbos that want attention and maybe a couple of bucks and will tell you the most bizarre sexual thing. And again, when two women with low-cut shirts and all fully made up are telling you about their wild sex time with an alien. Um, when you think about the aliens that you have had described to you over your lifetime, whoever you are, whether it's a reptilian or a gray or a tall white, or how many people said to you, and they got they don't tell you that these creatures are dressed usually they're not and he had a dick on him it was to his knees it was fantastic <laughs> you should have seen this how he was hung there's no mention of genitalia on aliens ever that i can think of which tells me they probably don't have what we have there's something under his armpit or something that we don't wouldn't know what to do with. This is when I say engage that thing between your ears. It actually works all on its own if you let it. So <laughs> engage it and say, you know, I, nobody ever talks about, you know, a well hung alien. Who are they, who, what are these women crazy? And, you know, it's very unlikely that a reptile would have the equipment to. You know, have wild sex with a, a, a human and a gray, I don't think has anything no, there between no, his legs. The gray, so, no, you know, the grays. Grays th don't this even. stuff, come on, people. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Grow up. <laughs> and yes, I said bad things about you, Heine. <laughs> Live with it. <laughs> well, you've certainly broken new ground tonight, I'll say that. By the way, by the way, since that interview goes back a long way, somebody will just have to go out and look for the original interview. But um, I did follow up that story about the alien sex fiends by contacting Bridget Nielsen, who was named in the article. And I've got a thunderous downpour going on here, so probably hear the rain pounding oh, I off. Hear me. it. Hear it? Yeah. Yeah. We're getting wow. we're getting torrential storms here. I contacted Bridget Nielsen both through her website and on Facebook and said, um, you, you, you posted a blog article. It said that the tabloid article that appeared uh, under the headline Alien Sex Fiends was um, basically a sensationalistic excerpt from a longer interview. Do you want to tell your story and follow up? We've reported on your story and we'll be happy to give you time. Nothing. Ever. You go, to this, you go to the website and you find out that what this really is, these are, these are fantasizing young girls who think this is cool and trendy. And they, they, they all sell jewelry. I don't know what the connection is, but they, then they all live in Roswell or in um, Sedona or some exotic locale where there's lots of UFOs flying around. 
And after a while, you just go, <clears throat> you know what? This is really just theater for poor people is all this is. It is, but it clogs the path. And people that then would maybe want to find some kind of information come across that and say, oh, this BS is so ridiculous. And that's the end of it. They don't further look into finding the people who could really give them true information. So what they are doing is dirtying the road so that no one else can pass. And that's a problem. So out of all of this, I think what we walk away with tonight is that, first off, we've got to pull ourselves back from these devices. Secondly, we need to gauge, engage our imagination, engage our intellect and our creative capacities, our, our individual genius. And we need to stop looking at cheap YouTube videos about women who have sex with reptiles. And, and, and Chris got to say penis on the show tonight. <laughs> it's awesome. It really is. I mean, we say no limits, no boundaries. Well, that, there's another one just right off the horizon. It's great. Of course, I don't ever say penis because, well, I don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, I just had the need, I must say. I think it was perfectly appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you sometimes got, you need one, and sometimes you don't. What yeah. does it tell you? So you got, you got anything else there that you want to un unload about before we... Uh, we I think that's it for this show. Boy, I think that, was quite, a, that was quite too. enough, yeah. Wow, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, we, what, we covered a lot of land, but, oh, I'll be back. And I'll you be will. loaded for bear. You will be back. Believe me. You will. I'm, I'm carrying the uh, ammo bag. And uh, <laughs> that's going to wrap it up for this time with Chris Holly and Randy Morgans, the Off Planet Radio podcast. And uh, I guess, what are we calling this uh, pair opinion? Well, these are our opinions. They are ne not necessarily those of anybody else on this planet, but we express them anyway, and we hope that... Uh, if you don't agree, you at least maybe got a good chuckle out of some of it. We'll be back with another show real soon. The truth actually is out there, but really, it's kind of inside you. Go find some of it. We'll be back very soon. Good night, Chris. Good night. Good night, everyone. This is on Planet Radio.